Hey, hey, party people. Welcome to my garment construction frequently asked questions video. A couple of disclaimers to start. Number one, I am a fashion designer who has been working in the fashion industry for a long time, which means in the context of this video, that means that the advice I give, the instructions, the techniques that I talk about are ones that are used in the industry and not by home sewers. Uh, I don't use commercial patterns or home patterns. I make and use fashion industry patterns. And like one of the biggest uh, differences is the seam allowances that I use. Uh, typically, you know, majority of seam allowances are like half an inch, unless you have a tight curve around your neck and things like that, which is a quarter inch. I know enough to be a designer. I studied sewing and pattern making and draping, and I know how to work with a sample making team, but that's my point of view in terms of garment construction. And Okotork techniques are a whole other category okay, because I've never worked in couture. Don't ask me questions on couture sewing techniques. That's not my expertise. The second note is I reference a lot of other videos in this video and other videos because I have more than 300 tutorials on my channel. And I think some of you don't know how to find other videos on my channel. Okay, don't go to the main YouTube search bar, go to my channel page. Each channel page has, a, has their own search bar for their channel. So go to mine, write down some keywords and it should help you a lot better. All right, first question. How much do designers need to learn? You need to know the basics, you know, uh, enough to know how garments get put together and enough to communicate with tech designers and your sample making team, enough to participate actively in fittings uh, so that you can look at something, notice something is wrong and offer solutions as to how to do it. So, for example, you might say we need to change this hem to a baby roll hem. That doesn't mean you have to be like so good at sewing baby roll hems, you know, that's what sewers are for, but you have to know what one is, when it's used, what fabrics it's good for, what it looks like, how, you know, things like that. What is the difference between draping and pattern making? Pattern making is drawing on paper or digitally, but drawing 2D to create the pieces you sew together to make a garment. Draping is when you take a piece of fabric, usually muslin, and you pin it to a dress form to mock up the garment, you know, like basically creating a rough draft of your garment. You mark up the drape, transfer the information to a piece of paper because all garments need a pattern in order to make multiples. What is the point of draping? Okay, draping doesn't make sense for every garment. Okay, draping, you know, a lot of the time in schools, they will uh, have you drape a basic bodice. And that's more for like, infer, uh, that's more for like educational purposes, not that you'll be doing a lot of draping basic bodices in the industry. Okay, draping a basic bodice, you're supposed to learn how garments relate to the body. Like when we draft waist darts, you know, you know, because you draped it on a dress form, why the waist start goes where it does, why it's as long as it is, why it's as wide as it is. You know, learning how to drape things on a dress form allows you to understand some of the basics of pattern making as it how relates to the body later on. So even if later on you never drape again, you kind of have that relationship, edge, you know, knowledge in your mind. Beyond that, draping works best for shapes that are more unconventional, uh, shapes that are hard to conceptualize as a flat pattern piece. 
you wouldn't drape something straightforward like a conventional dress shirt or a shift dress. It makes more sense to draft a pattern off a block for something like that. Madeline Vianney draped all her designs on a half form because she draped on the bias and she was designing shapes and cuts that were not the standard that many did not exist at the time. So in order to visualize it, she did it on the round 3D. Okay? And honestly, some people, they visualize designs better 3D. Some people are not inclined to sketching. They like the forming of their designs on a body better. What is muslin? Muslin is a thin plain leaf cotton with no stretch, no particular texture, no obvious wrong side, right side. It's usually unbleached, undyed. It's this like beigey raw cotton and it's used to create twalls, aka the garments rough drafts. And it's also used in draping on dress forms. And in the industry, people use this word. They, re they refer to the fabric. They also uh, refer a sample made out of muslin, a muslin, like where's the first muslin of this style? What kind of dress form do I need and where can I get one? I prefer industrial dress forms, not adjustable dress forms, the kind you find in company offices, fashion company offices. You can order them online and get them in lots of different sizes, petites, plus, male, female, children, uh, sections, like you can get just uh like you can get just waist to mid thigh for underwear you can get a whole body you can get one with legs or get one that's like a skirt form so wolf brand is what i see at fashion schools the most alvanon looks the closest to actual bodies and pgm is good for those on a budget so just google around i have a pgm you know it was inexpensive it's served me well, the end. Okay. What are the pros and cons of using a dress versus duct tape dummy? I've never used a duct tape dummy. I had to Google it. And my two concerns are, can you make a good symmetrical one that has really good proportions or shapes? And uh, as you pin things to your dummy, is it easy to slide pins in and out without it getting stuck and getting, you know, duct tape residue all over your pins? Would I be annoyed with the constant sticking slowed me down as I was working? How do you feel about adjustable dress forms? I've never used one and I have no inclination to. First of all, when I drape, I always pin center front or center back. Also side seam, you know, cause it's kind of like, uh, like an anchor for whatever is going on. I always want to know where center front is. So I always kind of like have an anchor for the design so that my grain line isn't going wonky all over the place. And a lot of these adjustable dress forms don't have a center front. As you expand the dress form, there's a gap where center front and center back should be. So that gets really annoying. I guess you could pin on either side of the gap. And I know some people will use it purely for fitting, but my other problem is, well, number one, the breasts. Generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, when a person gets larger, so do their breasts. And with an adjustable dress form, you're, uh, it's basically, you're widening the body, but the breasts stay the same. So you'd have to pad the breasts. And I mean, I guess if you are someone who does a lot of private client work and you have to adjust your mannequin or your dress form for each client's fit, that makes sense. And so you expand your dress form and you add the padding according to your client's measurements. Um, I guess in that way it would be useful, but that is not a business that I have had a lot. It's usually in fashion design offices, they have a sample size that they like to work with and they drape things on the sample size, they fit things on the sample size dress form and then grade up and down as necessary. What software skills do you need? 
If you're a fashion designer, you need Adobe Illustrator to do flats. And a lot of people ask me about Infinity so Affinity software uh, because it's cheaper than Adobe. It might be free. Uh, here's the thing is I don't have anything against Affinity. I haven't explored it much. I don't have anything against them except the industry standard is Adobe Illustrator. And that's what people look for on your resume. And that's why I encourage people to do that so they can find jobs. Okay. If I learn down the pipe that people are like, yes, affinity is used a lot and everyone wants it on their resume, then that's when I will recommend students learn it. Okay. For me, it's all about helping y'all find jobs. If you're going to go more into tech design and pattern making, I hear Optitex is the way or to, uh, is the way to go. More and more people are using Optitex instead of Gerber. Gerber used to be the standard, but less so. And Gerber is more used for plotting now. And, Designers don't really know, need to learn plotting. And more and more people are using things like Clothes 3D to create 3D models of clothes, which I'm told is fairly easy to know if, to use if you already know how to make patterns. So Adobe Illustrator for flats, Optitex for pattern making, Gerber for plotting, Clothes 3D for 3D modeling. Next question. Do you have any book recommendations for draping, pattern making, Yes, they are all in my Amazon store, amazon.com slash shop slash Zoe Hong. The link is in my description box and also the books that I'm going to show you in this video. What is the measurement difference between jacket lining to self fabric? Okay. I can talk about linings for a really long time. So let me know in the comments if you want a video all about linings, how to pick lining fabrics, designing the insides of garments, drafting and sewing linings, what is underlining versus interlining, all those things. But really fast, when you draft a lining, you have to add this lip, this overhang length, okay? And to draft that, you need to add one inch to the hem of the lining pattern. Uh, so your lip will hang half an inch over the top of the hem facing. And this amount may vary depending on the width of your hem facings, but one inch will work. And then you'll have an inch and a half hem facing, which is pretty standard. You just want to make sure that your lining doesn't hang past the bottom of the shell. How do you stop the seam from, I have all your questions here. How do you stop the seam from being wrinkly and wavy? Mm -hmm. It sounds like your thread tension is too tight on your sewing machine. And uh, so loosen the tension dial, you know, left, lefty loosey, righty tighty. And different fabrics require different tensions. So, you know, always sew up a little swatch when you're switching to a different fabric before you start sewing your final. How to draft a sleeve pattern? Okay, that is definitely something that would require its own video. So drop me a comment below if you want to how to draft sleeves video. What are some good seam finishes? Uh, you should watch my how to sew eight common seams video with Mariah. Okay, Hong Kong finish is one that we didn't do, but that's a good one too. Is it important to learn to read commercial patterns before designing your own clothing? No. Learn proper industry patterns, not home patterns. Does every pattern, even complicated garment patterns, all start from a basic block? Yes, unless the shape is such that it would be easier to drape first, okay? Blocks serve two purposes. One, they are a shortcut starting point. If you are designing any kind of shirt, any kind of woven shirt, you would take your woven bodice block and just start from there instead of drafting a bodice from scratch first. It, it, that's a huge waste of time. Okay? And two, they ensure a consistent fit across your brand. So all your size six pants should fit exactly the same around your hips, waist, and thighs. And you know, if you have a style that's shorter, you just shorten it and if you have a style where it flares at the bottom then you add the flare at the bottom you know add extra belt loops whatever but the fit should stay the same can you create a sloper pattern to build designs off of for yourself without draping okay first what is a sloper a sloper is a block 
a pattern block without seam allowances. And the industry uses blocks and not slopers. The majority of seam allowances are half an inch and tight curves are about quarter inch. So it's faster and easier to have the seam allowances already there on the block. Now you can create a block for yourself without draping. All you need is your body measurements. So have a friend help you if uh, you need. And if you want a basic torso block, then you'll need a bust, waist, you know, high hip, low hip, and then uh, HSP, high shoulder point, which is the high shoulder point to the hem, okay? And the differences in the length between your bust and your waist and then waist to high hip, you know, things like that. So get your measurements and then draft, make a muslin, fit it to yourself, and then finesse your block and move forward. Any tips for constructing garments for plus size women? Okay. Number one, the top complaint is uh, fit. Here's the thing, as a person gains weight, they, I'm sorry, I should have said this in the beginning. It's raining outside and uh, it's been raining kind of constantly the past few days and I tried to not film while it was raining, but there came a point where I just had to. Sorry about that. But when a person gains weight and look, look around the world and you'll see this yourself is people gain weight in different ways. Some people gain weight in their hips and thighs. Some people get a belly, some people's breasts grow. And so, you know, I've always been a huge fan of the idea of having different fit profiles for plus size. You'll see, you know, bigger companies like Gap, Lane Bryant, they do this thing where they have different uh, jeans fits, where they have some where accommodates a thicker waist, some accommodate, you know, a bigger waist to hip ratio, things like that. So fit is a huge deal. Uh, a lot of people just assume that they can take their ordinary size six sample size and just keep grading, but that doesn't really work. You need someone who, a pattern maker who really knows how to fit plus size people. And the second thing is fabrics. Cause you know, people use a lot of cheap, flimsy, clingy fabrics, and it doesn't look good, especially when women who might be sensitive to like rolls and curves, not lay, you know, fabric not laying right on, you know, their rolls and curves, and that's why people love to wear Spanx and stuff. Think about nice, thicker, more expensive, higher quality fabrics. I'm not saying you have to go full luxury, but Think about how a fabric sits on curves and rolls and whether it gives like a nice sleek look because the fabric is substantial enough to kind of like skim the body beautifully as opposed to just being clingy and thin and it just like static clings around every single curve like unattractively, you know, not a great look. So consider how your fabric drapes on the body. How to transfer draped ideas to patterns. Okay. You're going to want a tracing wheel. You're going to want something to protect your tabletop and a tracing wheel. Okay. So lay down your muslin with all the marks on the paper and then line up your grain lines, pin, use your fabric weights or your paper weights, same thing, and then use the tracing wheel to trace your lines and notches and all of the information. Use an awl to transfer your dot punch hole, dart punch holes if you need. Okay, lift up your fabric and draw in the lines. And I like to use rulers and French curves to help me make the lines really clean. And uh, there you have it. What is your opinion slash advice on using cables and wires in a clothing item? When I wear something, I want to be able to wear it, be able to sit, walk, put it on, take it off, move around, get in a cab and uh, without getting stabbed and poked all night. Okay. Uh, very light wires that have, that are capped at the ends neatly used strategically. It could be cool. What makes good construction of garments? Okay. Some things are like strong, even seams, you know, 
tight stitching, small stitches, quality fabric. The insides reveal a lot. You know, you don't want to see a lot of messy overlock. Uh, you know, clean overlock is great, but have you seen the kind that's like wavy and like random threads are all loose and, you know, there are a lot of better seam finishes. But I would recommend you watch my how to shop for quality clothing video. When you use lace appliques, do you sew them on before or after lining the garment? So this applies to any kind of decoration you want to do on something is when you open the garment, you want the garment to look nice. And, you know, I'm not saying that you have to line everything you stitch something to, but the inside should look nice and orderly. So if you do see stitching, it should look nice and neat. Okay. However, if you are going to line it, definitely do it before you line it. The whole purpose of the lining is just like clean finish, all of that, hide everything. So if you have like this beautiful clean finish inside lining, and then you have this like knot of stitching somewhere, not great. Also, the lining is supposed to move freely inside the jacket or whatever garment so that it's not pulling weirdly on the shell. And then if the, if you have like, you know, like a chest applique and it's like stuck together like that and it, it like the lining can't move freely, just, it's not good. Tips on long sleeves. How to not get bunching near the pit. Okay. With some styles, generally untailored styles, you're always going to get a little bit of fold over and bunching. You know, it helps to have a more precise armhole you know, cut away a little bit more in the front and a higher armhole, okay? And, uh, you know, if you hate even that, you could go for a gusset, which is totally old school, you know, something not a lot of people do anymore, but that really fits that armhole. Do you have any tips for someone who knows the theory but just can't get the thing to do the thing? Repeat after me. The learning is in the doing. 99% of the time, people who read the theory, they think they know something, but then when they are asked to do the thing, they don't know how because they haven't practiced it. The application of the theory is the actual learning. That's why teachers give students homework, is to apply the knowledge to an action to see how much you've learned. And... That's it. The learning is in the doing. Theory means nothing unless you're actually doing the thing. So you're like, yeah, I know that. And yeah, I know that. And, you know, someone could ask you a question and you get the theory of the thing. But until you do it, you haven't really learned it. And so if that's your motivation, it's like, I don't really know it unless I've actually done it. So I need to go do the thing. I need to go practice the thing. Get off your butt. Do you have any techniques to create structure using lightweight fabrics? Okay, to create structure, you can add interfacing, and these can be a fusible. And fusibles have these little dots of glue on one side, and you iron it onto the fabric. Or you can have sew-in interfacing. And do you see the little shiny, it's like hard to see individual dots on some of these, but you'll see like the shiny, sort of sheen, little plasticky feel of glue dots on one side of interfacing. Okay. Interfacing, also, also called interlining, have their own pattern pieces in a full garment pattern, and they should be included on your pattern card. And if you want the whole piece fused, you'll make a pattern piece the same as the fabric piece with an eighth of an inch trimmed off on all sides so that it's big enough that it will catch in the seam allowance, but it does, it's not exactly the same. So the person who's fusing the piece on, it doesn't have to be like, a struggle to get every edge lined up perfectly. Okay. Block fusing is when you fuse fabric yardage and then you cut out the pattern pieces out of the fused fabric. Interfacings, they come in different structures and weights. I would recommend you pick up a few and do some tests on your final fabric. Is a full facing necessary for a dress? I don't know what you mean by full facing. Uh, I think you mean lining, but uh, for facings, you know, you have facing that covers part of the inside of a dress with a self or contrast fabric, or you can line the whole dress with a lining fabric, or you can have both. 
Um, you want facings if you're using them, where parts of the dress will show when the dress is on a hanger, or if the facing will help clean finish parts of the inside of the dress, like center front neck, or center back neck, sorry, armhole, pockets. This is an old prototype. After I made this, I decided I don't want leather sitting on the back neck like that, so we switched that out, but this was a first sample. And uh, yeah, so you can clean finish these edges. The inside looks much nicer when you have facings and linings. And when you look at a jacket lapel, what you're really seeing is the facing, the jacket front facing folded out. What is the best way to cut and sew silk organza? <laughs> I know this may sound specific, but this is kind of, you know, a lot of these can be, uh, these questions can be applied to different fabrics. And this one is good for any fabric that likes to move around. I call certain fabrics dancing queen fabrics because, you know, that house shimmies even when there's no music playing. It just moves around and you can't even breathe around it without just like, gliding across your cutting table. When we were in school, we used to cut these sort of slinky dancing queen fabrics with a layer of tissue paper, okay? And it kind of just gave it enough friction, something to grip onto, so we would pin layers of tissue paper or one layer of tissue paper onto the organza or similar fabrics. Sometimes you can even like sew with the tissue paper because this kind of paper just like, tissue paper just rips right off the seams really easily. And yeah, I know a lot of people are like, oh, no paper cutting with my fabric shears. But the, the tissue paper we used was like really soft. It was almost like fabric. It wasn't like your typical gift wrap, sharp tissue paper. I also use these specifically if I'm using, if I'm cutting paper and fabric together for whatever reason, I use these ginormous paper shears. These I have for Oak Tag, you know, the, it's pattern paper that looks like manila file folder paper. And they're, do you hear that? They're sturdy, they're strong, they're sharp. They will handle paper and, and fabric. You just have to sharpen regularly. Whether or not you use the tissue paper, you're gonna want a lot of fabric weights. It doesn't really matter. These, uh, these work, I use them constantly. You don't have to buy paperweights. If you have clean food jars, clean them out, put stuff in here, you know, rocks, whatever, like whatever you have laying around, office supplies, just throw them in there to make them heavy and then just plot them across your yardage. Whenever you draft a pattern, you always have to think about what kind of fabric you're drafting for. So if I'm drafting a pattern for a dancing queen fabric like organza, then I'm going to throw in a few more notches to help out with the sewing, especially with longer seams. And when you're sewing, again, if you're really shaky with this kind of fabric, you know, feel free to hand base, you know, like some long basting stitches to kind of fold all the pieces together. And when you do this, I recommend you use a thread that is a different color than your base fabric. So you can see the basting stitches really easily and just pick them out when you're done. What is the best way to control easing? Okay. So sewing ease, all right? Sewing ease is when you are uh, sewing a wider section, a longer section of a seam into a shorter section to have, and you're easing it in. Okay? And this is a technique I learned in school. Okay? Put your sewing machine on a basting stitch, a big stitch, and let's say your seam allowance is half an inch. We're going to do this on a princess seam bodice, which is one of the most common spots where you sew ease. Okay? put in two rows of basting stitches inside the seam allowance, okay? Make sure that the, both those lines of stitching stay inside that half inch seam allowance. Pin notch to notch, okay? So the piece that is larger, okay? So you're putting basting stitches on the larger piece. It needs to be eased in, so we're gonna gently 
like gather this longer section as evenly as possible. How to do that? Grab the two top threads on either side and pull them, okay? Don't pull all four threads, you know, the two rows, top and bottom thread of each, just the top two and start gathering those stitches and pin them as necessary. Okay? Make sure you don't have any big pinches in the gathers or they'll get sewn in. Shorten your stitch length back on your machine to something more normal, like eight to 10 stitches an inch. So that's like for this machine, two and three quarters or so. Uh, I know the numbers on these dials, they don't actually reflect any numbers like on the fabric. I don't know. When you sew, you'll sew with the gathers on top so that you, I can see if I'm sewing any pinches or gathers into the seam. Um, and you're gonna be slightly pulling on the bottom layer as you sew, okay? You do this a few times, you will get to a point where you won't need the extra step of sewing in the basing stitches, but this is a great way to practice getting used to kind of like pinning in ease and then sewing it in. What is the easiest way to create volume when patterning? Slash and spread. It's like almost any technique where you're creating volume, you're slashing and then spreading where you want the volume, okay? You're going, uh, if you want fullness in the cap, you're spreading out the pieces near the cap. You're spreading, uh, if you want volume near the cuff, near the elbow, near the uh, wrist, you're going to slash and spread out more around the hem, okay? And that, this method is, is used for many, many sleeve styles. Do you have a Facebook community group? Yes, link is in the description box. I also have a product development Pinterest board where I pin cool garment details and processes. I also have a garment construction playlist here on YouTube, so go check out those videos. I go over tools, you know, I have Mariah Guest uh, with draping and sewing videos. It's a good time. I hope that answered a lot of your questions and inspired you to get your hands dirty. And that is metaphorical, not actually dirty, but like I said before, the learning is in the doing. Please give this video a thumbs up if you learned something new today. Share, subscribe, join us over on my Patreon podcast. The link is below. All my links are in the description box. And remember, hashtag always be practicing, hashtag practice not magic. Hashtag if your first one sucks, you're right on track. And the new one, hashtag the learning is in the doing. And I'll see you in the next video.